It is therefore time for question period. The member from Nepean Carlton. My question is uh, to the Minister of Finance. Uh, good morning, Minister. After promising a balanced budget just weeks ago, the Minister broke that promise by announcing he would plunge our province into an $8 billion deficit. Shame. And just on Monday, the Premier doubled down in her throne speech with that same number. On April the 2nd, the Premier said, and I quote, I think Everyone here knows that eliminating the deficit is the most important thing we can do to, for economic growth. Mr. Speaker, why is this government promising a deficit when they know it will harm the economy? Thank you. Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I appreciate the member opposite and her open letter to us today, uh, recognizing some of the measures being taken. So let me start off by saying we have slayed the deficit since we came into office. We have not only a balanced budget, Mr. Speaker, at this moment, we have a surplus, Mr. Speaker. And that surplus and that financial strength is enabling us to do a number of initiatives that we're choosing to do on behalf of the people of Ontario. And the member opposite has, has made reference to the fact that there are needs out there, needs that we have been addressing by providing OHIP Plus, by providing free tuition, by ensuring that we have a more secure retirement for those that are of seen, seniors and, and further on with the uh, CBP enhancement. We've taken these measures, and Mr. Speaker, every time we've done these progressive measures while balancing the books, they yes, voted against that, Mr. Speaker. We are there to support the people of Ontario. Indications are uh, your continuation of what happened yesterday, so uh, we will be moving very quickly. I'm also going to remind some members uh, of the government side that while the member was answering, I was hearing heckling, which meant that they were interfering with their own member. And that's not conducive to the same, because I was going to say the same thing about the opposition side. So I, I noted that. So. We will conduct ourselves properly, and we will move to warnings if it continues. Thanks, Speaker. The thing that the minister can read my open letter, too bad he can't read a balance sheet. The government likes to think that if they throw money around to their insider friends and no one will catch on to their waste and mismanagement, with, while servicing the debt and the deficit has become the third largest spending priority of this government outside of health and education, they have started to move money from vital public services as a result, and we've seen that with mental health wait times across the province in Ontario as they have steadily increased. The lack of fiscal discipline and the intellectual dishonesty in this argument. The member will withdraw. Hit a nerve. Withdrawn. I always like to hit a nerve with this Liberal crowd. But their argument is a that they accompany with it is harmful to Ontarians. Will Question. the minister finally admit he is only running a $8 billion deficit in order to pass out pre-election trinkets to save their Thank skin? Yeah. Thank you. Minister. What's harmful, Mr. Speaker, is their alternatives of cutting and slashing and burning the very programs that people rely on. What's harmful is them not wanting to make infrastructure investments to stimulate economic growth. What's harmful is that they would vote against increasing jobs. Over 800,000 net new jobs have come to our province since we came into power. Mr. Speaker, over these challenging times that we had to experience through a recession, they stood on their hands. They turned their backs on the people of Ontario. We invested. We were strategic in our investments, and we didn't cut health care. We didn't cut education. We didn't cut the programs that people rely on. In fact, we bolstered those investments, and our economy grew. We're leaving Canada. We're leaving the G7. We have the lowest unemployment in Canada in 20 years, Mr. Speaker. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. We are now in warnings. Final supplementary. Well, I have a message for the minister. As Doug Ford would say, the party with the taxpayer money is over. Surely he knows that. Thank you. 
about four people just missed a warning. If you want to get your last licks in, do it now, and I'll warn you now. You may finish. Was it something I said, like <laughs> Doug Ford or the party's over? Which didn't you like? Surely the government knows that whatever problems their government says they will solve, they either created them or they presided over them for the past 15 years, and they cannot hide from the fact. And if this government was doing so well, then I ask them, why is there a homeless couple at Bay and Bloor whose wife is suffering from, brain, from breast cancer? Why was a London man denied a hospital bed before dying out of country? And why are our hospitals so over capacity that some young mental health care patients are waiting upwards of 18 years? That's not under the Progressive Conservatives' watch. It's First under time. the Ontario Liberal government's watch. Thank you. Crusader, please. Crusader, please. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member opposite spoke about Doug Ford. Obviously very conflicted here, Mr. Speaker. On the one hand, they have a $16 billion hole they got to fill. And he's saying we may balance or we may not. He's not decisive. We may sell marijuana right next to schools or we may not. He's undecided. He wants to make cuts. He has to make cuts based upon what he says. That is not sawing into fat, Mr. Speaker. We have already included almost $1 to $2 billion in transformations and savings every year into our, our plan. We're the lowest cost government as a result. He's going to saw into bone, Mr. Speaker. He's going to make life even harder for the people of Ontario. The member opposite have five requests in order to support our budget. Let me read them to you. We want a plan to balance the budget immediately. We're balanced. We got a surplus. They want a commitment. They want a commitment to lower hydro rates more than their 12 percent. We got 40 and 60 percent reduction in hydro rates in rural Thank communities. You. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so am I. New question. Member from Nepean and Carlton. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Uh, this government's reckless spending and love of scandal has cost Ontarians dearly. They don't care. The Liberals simply do not care. If they cared, we wouldn't have 40 per cent of children unable to access mental health treatment that they need. If they cared, we wouldn't have a 67 per cent increase in hospitalizations for children with mental health disorders. If they cared, it wouldn't take six months to see a psychiatrist after a suicide attempt. Mr. Speaker, this government cares to claim only now. 15 years after the fact. Why didn't they care for the first 15? Mr. Speaker, and I, um, I'm sorry that the member opposite wasn't able to be at Cam H today, Mr. Speaker, yeah. when we made an announcement that addresses. Actually, I think it's the third point in her uh, in her uh, list. So, a plan to get the budget back to balance. We uh, we've done that. Match our commitment to get hydro rates down. Okay, we've reduced those, Mr. Speaker. And then she talks about scrapping cap and trade, providing tax relief. That means tax cutting. That means revenue cutting, Mr. Speaker. And then she says match our commitments on long-term care and mental health. So, Mr. Speaker, the member opposite, uh, their, what their position is that they're going to cut and they're going to invest, Mr. Speaker, it doesn't work that way. We know what happens there is that there is simply cutting. What we announced this morning, Mr. Speaker, were investments that are going to relieve people who are dealing with mental health issues all over this province, Mr. Speaker, children, adults in the north, in the south, in the east, in the west of this province, Mr. Speaker, a plan that has been put in place by, with uh, advisors, patients. Thank you. Supplementary. If the Premier. Speaker, please. Okay. <clears throat> Supplementary. If the Premier actually cared, she's been part of a government for 15 years, she would not have waited on the 11th hour, 78 days before a provincial election where her party is right now third in the polls. How many suicides did it take for this government to notice? How many patients turned away for treatment did it take for them to notice? It's disingenuous for the Liberals to say they care now. The member will withdraw. Withdrawn. I will take care of that. 
You have pushed too far. The only thing they care about is re-election. Mr. Speaker, why, after 15 years, is this government only now committing to investing in mental health? Thank you. That is just not accurate. The reality is that we put in place a mental health strategy in 2011, Mr. Speaker, and in every budget, Mr. Speaker, we have increased supports to mental health. Supports, Mr. Speaker, that they have voted against. Yeah, absolutely. Every single time, Mr. Speaker. So whether it's $140 million over three years that we announced in February of last year, Mr. Speaker, $74 million over three years to provide faster access to mental health services, Mr. Speaker, uh, an additional support of 1,150 supportive housing units, Mr. Speaker. All Premier. Mr. Speaker, in terms of uh, mental health uh, supports for children and youth, uh, $100 million in new investments, Mr. Speaker, we put in place to uh, put supports for young people across yes, the sir. province. Every single time they have voted against them, Mr. Speaker, we announced the largest investment in mental health in Canadian history, but that builds, Mr. Speaker, on supports we've been putting in place for years. Final supplement, Mr. Speaker. The reality is no one in this province believes them. And no one in this province believes they care about the issues outside of getting themselves re-elected. If this government cares, the Minister of Municipal, uh, Municipal Affairs is warned. The President of the Treasury Board is warned. The next thing after warning is naming. Finish, please. This government cared. They wouldn't have allowed a young man to be turned away from the doors at the urgent care department at St. Joe's. Just remember what one mental health care worker told the, the Finance Committee. We've had people turned away from the doors in the urgent care department at St. Joe's. One of those poor souls committed suicide in the parking lot. No services, no psychiatric services that can be attained in a timely manner. This is unacceptable. Mr. Speaker, that is unacceptable. Question. And where is the accountability? And why do they only care now, 78 days Thank before you. an election? The member from Nepean Carlton is warned. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, I can tell you that there were families, uh, there were practitioners, there were um, people who lead uh, care organizations at the announcement this morning, Mr. Speaker, and they've been working with us for a number of years as we have put increased investments into the mental health system, Mr. Speaker. They have been working with us to make sure that we take the next steps to uh, put the supports in place. So, Mr. Speaker, today we announced that there would be access for every school in the province to mental health professionals, Mr. Speaker. We announced that there would be base increases to community agencies who deliver mental health services, Mr. Speaker. Member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke is warned. We announced over 2,000 uh, more beds, uh, more supportive housing uh, units, Mr. Speaker. So the reality is that we are building on supports that we have already Answer. put in place, but we recognize that there's more that has to be done, and that's exactly what the announcement was today, Thank you. Mr. Speaker. New question, the leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Mira Etlin Stein and her partner Brian Leahy are both self employed. They have a nearly two year old daughter, and this young family is working very hard, but they do not have health benefits like dental coverage. The last time Mira was at the dentist was two years ago. For Brian, it's been five years, and their daughter has never seen a dentist. The Liberal government has had 15 years to implement a dental program that would help Mira and her family. Why didn't they? Thank you, Premier. 
Mr. Speaker, uh, you know I um, I welcome this uh, this yes. approach that the um, that the leader of the third party is taking, Mr. Speaker. I recognize that um, that expanding dental and uh, drug coverage uh, important. are important steps that have to Absolutely. be taken, Mr. Speaker. The uh, the member opposite knows that we expanded the Healthy, Healthy Smiles program, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite knows that we have moved forward on providing pharmacare, Mr. Speaker, for for people under the age of 25 and people over the age of 65, Mr. Speaker. And we recognize Stay that there tuned. is that there is more that needs to be done. So I I don't disagree with the leader of the third party that there is more that we have to do to help people who don't have those benefits, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Fifteen years is a long time, Speaker. Yep. This could have been done a long time ago. The Premier and this Liberal government know that access to dental care is an issue they should have known for the last 15 years. They know that the government can do something about it. But instead of investing in families like Mira's, they chose to privatize or pri rather prioritize other things, like selling off Hydro One. That was the priority of Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals, which means that instead of the revenue Hydro One generates being used, like things uh, on things like dental care, dental care programs for Mar Mira's family, that money is now in the pockets of private investors. Mira and Brian should be able to go to the dentist regularly. So should their daughter. Speaker, why did the premier choose instead to prioritize lining the pockets of the already wealthy with the Hydro One sell-off instead of investing in a dental plan that would help everyday families? Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, you know, I, um, as I said before, I recognize that uh, that there are people in this province who are under a lot of stress. That they are looking for supports, Mr. Speaker, and we have we have put in place supports: the pharmacare, uh, pharmacare for children and youth, Mr. Speaker, up to age of 25, free tuition, increasing the minimum wage, and we recognize that there is more that needs to be done. Which is exactly why, in the throne speech, we outlined the areas where we believe there is the most need that we need to step up so that people can care for themselves and care for each other. I don't disagree with the leader of the third party that there's more that needs to be done, and we are stepping up and we are going to put those supports in place. Yeah. Final supplementary. People are under stress because for 15 years this Liberal government has left them swinging in the wind. That's why they're under stress. <laughs> Speaker. Entrepreneurs, musicians, artists, freelancers, and others in the gig economy need workplace health benefits, starting with dental care. Seniors need dental care. Folks on social assistance need dental care. But instead of prioritizing the needs of everyday families, the Liberals spent a billion dollars on the gas plant scandal. Their policies have ensured that corporations and the wealthiest don't pay their fair share in our province. They sold off Hydro One, and they wasted $8 billion on P3 projects that could have been completed for far, far less. 4.5 million people in Ontario can't afford to go to the dentist. Why weren't they the Premier's priority during her Question, time in office? Health, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And as the Premier has affirmed, of course, dental care in particular has been a focus of our government and the Ministry of Health and Long Term Care. We took the original Children in Need of Treatment program, SINOT as it was known, and expanded it across the province into the Healthy Smiles yeah, program. Yeah, and this great. is now helping more than 450,000 kids wow. getting important dental services. Well, and we're absolutely committed to ensuring that children have have this very good start in life in yeah. terms of uh, what we call healthy smiles, very important for their future. The Premier has alluded, and of course in the throne speech, we have made very clear that we know there's more to do. We know there's more to do across several populations, and we will continue to work in this regard. As, it refers to, as the member referred to uh, those on social assistance, there is a program of dental benefits available. And so we continue to make these improvements. This is what our government's all about. We're about caring for people and giving them Take the very care. best opportunity. New question. The leader of the third party. My question is uh, for the Premier Speaker. Let me tell the Minister of Health and the Premier of this province about Synot and Healthy Smiles. Dr. Elizabeth Richardson in Hamilton, the <laughs> Hamilton Medical Officer of Health, released a report this week that says this about children in our, pro in our city. Thousands of Hamiltonians don't have access to dental coverage, and she said that right now in Hamilton, 42 percent. 
of children currently in second grade have a history of tooth decay, a result of not having regular access to dental cleanings and preventative dental care. What does the Premier have to say to the parents of these children about why she has done nothing to help them in her time of off in office? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, again, I would uh, just reinforce what the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care has said. We recognize that there is more to be done, Mr. Speaker, but we have expanded the programs, for, uh, particularly for children, yeah. Mr. Speaker, to provide supports for kids who otherwise wouldn't be able to, uh, to access dental care. But I think, Mr. Speaker, this issue is much like the pharmacare issue in that had, had we the ability to go back to 1969, Mr. Speaker, and have the discussion about uh, Medicare again, I think we would, with what we know now, I think we would suggest that perhaps pharmacare and dental care needed to be part of that, uh, that Medicare package, Mr. Speaker. That, that, that is to say those— We can agree, Mr. Speaker, that those are gaps that should have been filled, but we can't go back to 1969. We have been working, Mr. Speaker, to expand Answer. the programs for children in this province for dental care. We know there's more to be done, Mr. Speaker, so we don't disagree with the Leader of the Third Thank Party. Thank you. Speaker, Dr. Richardson's report said that one in ten grade two students in Hamilton require urgent dental care, and that many schools in the city report very high rates of untreated cavities in their students. She is trying to expand at the city level free dental programs so that more people in my community can go to the dentist without worrying about how they're going to be able to pay for it. Why has the Premier left municipalities and local medical officers of health to deal with this serious medical issues on their this serious medical issue on their own? Why hasn't she done anything in her 15 years in office to help? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, once again, and I know the Minister of Health will want to comment on the specifics again, but just, just to remind the Leader of the Third Party, we have been making increases into, in the program to, uh, to help kids with dental health problems. Mr. Speaker, we've put healthy smiles in place. We've expanded that program. There is more to be done. And with all due respect to the Leader of the Third Party, Mr. Speaker, I don't remember seeing this in her platform, and I don't remember seeing her talk to us about healthy smiles, Mr. Speaker. So I appreciate I appreciate that she is now making this a cause celebre. We have been working to increase those supports, Mr. Speaker. We know that there's more to be done, but Mr. Speaker, you know, to suggest that somehow she's been on this and we haven't is just not the case, Mr. Speaker. You see it, please. You see it, please. Thank you. Stop the clock. Final supplementary. Well, Speaker, with all the resources of the third party, we can't always do the government's job. Speaker, we can't always do the government's job. Let me still give my idea. <laughs> Look, the programs that they are lauding have failed. Grade two students were born around 2011. This government has been in office since 2003. Where the heck have they been, Speaker? Families who can't afford a dentist have no choice but to let their oral health issues get so bad that they require medical. Ladies and gentlemen, I think it's just called respect. Carry on. 
Their oral health issues get so bad that they actually require medical attention in our hospitals because when you go to a hospital, you don't have to pay out of pocket. And I was outraged when I read Dr. Richardson's report this week. It is heartbreaking to me that parents are being forced to let their kids go without the care that they need because they just can't afford it. No parent should be put in that situation. And those MPPs over there may say it's boring, but it's the truth. Why hasn't the Premier done anything about this in her 15 years in office, Speaker? Here, here. Mr. Speaker, I'm, you know. Thank you. I think it's I think it's appropriate that the leader of the third party is outraged, Mr. Speaker, as I was outraged five, six years ago, Mr. Speaker, which is exactly why we have been putting more supports in place to help kids with, uh, with um, dental issues, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. The reality is that this is a gap. It is a gap in our health care system, as PharmaCare is a gap. We have taken a major step forward in terms of putting hydro—, putting hydro Leader of the third party is warned. Carry on. And I, you know, I really do believe that this is an important conversation that we did start by yeah. increasing supports for uh, kids and adults with uh, with dental issues, Mr. Speaker. It's something that it's something that needs to be expanded. We recognize that, and I think what would have been helpful over the last few years is if the leader of the third party yes, had raised this and we had had a conversation, and there had been suggestions that could have come forward about how to move yeah, on this. This is a national challenge, Mr. Speaker. We have not heard constructive ideas from the third party, but we're, you know, we're you. open to them, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. No question. And then from Bruce Gray, Owen Much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Your pre-election throne speech preached about, and I quote, care is all around, this impulse to care for people who are struggling. Well, Premier, Todd Rubchak's family wants to know why you won't practice what you preach. His wife says, and I quote, you're letting him rot in a Florida hospital instead of bringing him home so he can get the care he needs in an Ontario hospital. Premier, your speeches are just talk and no substance. But if I'm wrong, then please prove it. Will you instruct your Minister of Health right here, right now, to get on the phone and find Todd Rubchak a hot bed here in an Ontario hospital? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, what is just, there are many things that are disturbing about this story, and it's uh, it's unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that there are beds in Ontario. There are beds here that could be available. So the challenge is, Mr. Speaker, what is happening with that insurance company that they are not able to work with the system to find those beds? The the minister will speak to the details of uh, a meeting that she is going to be having. But, Mr. Speaker, we are going to figure out where that. So. The member from Leeds Greenville is warned. Finish, about where that disconnect is, Mr. Speaker, there are beds here in Ontario, and the insurance company should be able to access them. Thank you. To the Premier, please, Mr. Speaker. Time and again, you say you care, but when put to the test, you fail insurance in the most critical time of need. It's unacceptable that you failed Larry Dan. It's unacceptable that you failed Stuart Klein when you left him languishing in a Mexico hospital due to a lack of a hospital beds in Ontario, and sadly, Mr. Klein died. Now Todd Rubchak's life hangs in your hands. <coughs> if your Minister of Health won't pick up the phone and you find it so acceptable, Premier, will you find him a hospital bed today? Thank you. Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Well, thank care. you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I think we can all really sympathise with the families involved in these uh, very difficult cases. As the Premier has said, there seems to be this disconnect between knowing, uh, as we know, that there are beds available across Ontario and the insurance company's efforts, and I'm sure they are making good efforts to try and connect to find those beds. And this is precisely why we're asking questions about this, why this disconnect is occurring, and we want to make sure that everyone has the benefit of, obviously, our wonderful world-class health care system here in Ontario. So I have invited members of the insurance associations to meet directly with me very, very yeah. soon with officials from my ministry. And in particular, in this case, our office um, has been working extremely closely with the Toronto Central Lynn on this particular case, and we're hoping that uh, this case will be resolved in the very, very near Great future. Answer. Thank, Thank you. you. Your question, the member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier, and I'm going to follow on the lead taken by my colleague there. Todd Rabchak is an 83-year-old man from Toronto. 
He's stuck in a hospital in Florida. His leg is infected, and he can't stand or walk. Todd and his wife Lillian need to come home now. They need to get back to Toronto to be seen by Todd's own doctors and physiotherapists. But their insurance company can't find a hospital bed for Todd in Toronto. No one here is surprised. No one here is surprised. Why is the Premier doing nothing to stop the overcrowding in our hospitals so that people like Todd can get the health care that they need? Of health and long -term care. Sure of health, long -term care. I can assure the member opposite, Mr. Speaker, that we're doing everything we possibly can in terms of my ministry, the local LIN. We are working extremely hard in this particular case. We need to coordinate services so that they, in fact, are seamless in these very difficult situations. We're aware that uh, 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 the individual in question uh, has had treatment from a particular hospital in Toronto, and we are working extremely hard to ensure that he gets back as soon as possible to those physicians who know his case very well already. So I can simply say that we will continue to work on this particular case, and in the supplementary, we'll address uh, the broader systemic issue. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. This keeps happening week after week because Ontario's hospitals are dangerously overcrowded. Joe Glowacki, Stuart Klein, David Ronald, Danny Marchand, Larry Dan. All of these people were told in recent weeks that they couldn't come home because there were no hospital beds available when they faced a health care emergency. Can the Premier tell us right now how many more Ontarians waiting in pain will it take to convince her that this overcrowding crisis is real? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, I need to reiterate there are critical care beds available in Ontario. Yes. The beds are there. What we have is a systemic disconnect in terms of communication between uh, the out-of-country hospital and physicians, the insurance, insurance company, company, and our health officials on the ground. And that's precisely why I have invited members of the insurance communities affected to meet directly with me. Uh, we can all understand the suffering in terms of the individual, the families involved. We are determined to ensure that we have a streamlined system so insurance companies know how to access the beds that I would like to say yet again are available here in our world-class health care system. Thank you. Thank you. Your question, the member from Etobicoke North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of uh, Health. This question on behalf of the people of Etobicoke North who I've been proud to represent for the past 15 years. Speaker, providing all Ontarians with timely access to care that they need, whether at home, in the community, or in one of our full-service hospitals, is of course of the utmost importance to our government and to me personally as a physician. Our health care system has many things to be proud of, from our doctors, nurses, support workers, even our volunteers. We continue to reduce wait times for surgery, increase access to primary health care providers, and expand services for Ontarians at home and in their communities. Life expectancy is higher than the national average and one of the highest in the world. And thank you, by the way, Minister, for the $400 million expansion for Etobicoke General Hospital. We have the best survival rates in the country for prostate, breast, colorectal, and lung cancers. And even the Fraser Institute, God bless them, and the Wait Time Alliance have consistently ranked Ontario as having some of the shortest wait times question. in Canada. Speaker, my question is this. The speech from the throne outlined our government's plan for a brighter future for our health care system. And can the minister please expand on those thank investments? You. Mr. Felt, long -term care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the member for Etobicoke North for this very yeah. important question yeah, and for giving question. me an opportunity to discuss how our government is choosing to continue investing in care. We've all seen that a growing and aging population is contributing to the pressures faced by our health care system. And we're continuing to support the people of this province by making monumental investments in mental health announced this morning, yes. health care and home care. That's why we're making a deliberate choice to run a deficit to invest more in the people who are making our province strong. People of this province will see major investments from our government in the services that they need, including the expansion of government programs that are already making it easier for people to care for their loved ones and help them to succeed. Programs like OHIP Plus that are helping to alleviate the financial burden many families face. A program that has provided more than Answer. 1 million young individuals with free prescription drugs since January 1st. We will continue to fight for historic Thank programs you. like OHIP+. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Minister. First of all, for detailing to this House how critical health care is in our, the entire system to our province and to our government, as well as the once-in-a-generation expansion of pharmacare. I know that my own residents in Etobicoke North welcome and appreciate these, uh, these sorts of investments. Speaker, yesterday the Premier was joined by the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care, as well as the Minister of Seniors Affairs, to make announcements that support care, create opportunity and make life more affordable during this period of rapid economic change. I myself was at a seniors health fair in Etobicoke North run by the Rexdale Health Center, and we were able to determine and announce that almost more than uh, 10,000 uh, children have received free medications as a result of our Pharmacare expansion. And that, of course, Speaker, as you will know, includes an entire list of 4,400 medications available to Ontarians broadly. Speaker, we also know that we have a collective responsibility question. to care for our seniors. So my question is, can the minister please inform this House of the support uh, expansions that we're making to, uh, for seniors across the province? Thank you. Minister. Minister of Seniors Affairs. Minister for Seniors Affairs. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the member from Etobicoke North for this great question. And I know that as a physician, he knows very well that, Mr. Speaker, approximately 70 per cent of Ontario seniors take at least one medication daily, and 30 per cent of seniors in Ontario take at least five prescription drugs every day. Wow. So you can imagine these costs do add up, and that's why I am so proud, as the Minister of Seniors, that yesterday I stood with our Premier and the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care to announce that we will now be expanding OHIP Plus to anybody over the age of 65. What this means is that prescription drugs now in Ontario for anybody over the age of 65 will soon be completely free. No copay, no deductible. This means, <laughs> this means Mr. Speaker, no copay, no, no deductible for over 2.6 million seniors and their families. Thank Our you. seniors told us we need. New question. Member for Simcoe Gray. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Minister of Energy. Uh, in August 2017, the Environmental Review Tribunal ruled against a proposal to build eight 500 foot tall wind turbines in my riding due to significant public safety concerns and their close proximity to the Collingwood Airport and Clearview Aerodrome. Citizen groups and organizations worked hard to stop this project and have since made an attempt to have their legal costs awarded or repaid by the tribunal. This government has cost hardworking citizens in my riding over $850,000 and local municipalities an additional $800,000. So, Mr. Speaker, the Green Energy Act won't allow these groups and individuals to get their money back. Will the minister change this legislation to allow the tribunal to award costs? Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. When it, uh, when it comes to community engagement into the renewable procurement process, um, we, we did listen um, to many of the community groups in the past, and, and Mr. Speaker, we did try to strike the right balance between early community engagement and achieving value for ratepayers by, by putting an emphasis on cost. And, and I can appreciate uh, where, where the, uh, my friend, the opposition friend, is coming from. This, uh, this process, Mr. Speaker, um, is administered by the ISO and is overseen um, by an external fairness advisor. And so even when a uh, contract is offered, um, the process is not over. And I, I, I believe that's part of the question that uh, my uh, honorable colleague has mentioned. So Mr. Speaker, project developers um, through this process must obtain all required licenses and approvals, such as the Renewable Energy Approval or the REA, um, or an environmental assessment before they can start construction on those projects, Mr. Speaker. And I look forward Thank to you. speaking more in the supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, back to the minister. Uh, minister, your government caused my constituents and my municipalities to spend over $1.6 million. Nobody ever thought any government would be stupid enough to approve five, uh, eight, 12, I guess, in the beginning, 500 foot windmills between two airports. But since you made that decision, and your ministry made that decision, your government made that decision, it caused my constituents and my municipalities to spend this money at the tribunal. They won at the tribunal. Thank God, finally, common sense. Uh, came to light. Uh, these citizens did you a favor. Pilots were going to get killed. It was never a question of when someone, if someone was going to get killed. It was always a question of when someone was going to get killed. They did you a favor by forcing the tribunal to do the right thing. You owe them $1.6 million. Will you do the right thing and pay them back? 
Minister. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, when looking at the process that we put in place, it is to strike that right balance between making sure that communities have a process in place to ensure that they can actually express their views and actually put projects um, you know, in the right light, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that if there are concerns, that they can bring those concerns forward. As I said before, we really worked hard, Mr. Speaker, with, with the ISO to strike that right balance between early community engagement and achieving value for rate payers, rate payers Mr. Speaker, by, by putting an emphasis on cost. And I know um, the ISO and the External Fairness Advisor, Mr. Speaker, are in place to ensure that that happens. And I know working with the ISO, the province will continue, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that all renewable energy procurement encourages the selection of projects with yes, local support uh, and the most competitive prices, as well as with projects with First Nations and the Métis participation. Thank you. New question, the member from London Fanshawe. My, my question to the Premier. In 2016, the Premier tabled a budget that would increase drug costs for seniors by more than 70 per cent. In 2016, that was wrong. We fought the government, and we won. The Premier backed down. Two years ago, the Premier tried to slash drug coverages for seniors. What has changed, other than there being an election in 78 days? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, so basically what the uh, member opposite is saying is that um, when a policy is brought forward and when there's, uh, when there's consultation on it, when there's a reaction and a government changes their mind and uh, puts in place a better policy, that that's not a good idea, Mr. Speaker. Well, what I would say to the, uh, what I would say to the, uh, to the third party and to this member, Mr. Speaker, I believe that that's how good policy is made. I believe, I believe that we talk to people, we come up with, uh, with a solution, Mr. Speaker, and we put that forward. We have moved forward with the— The member from Hamilton Mountain is warned. Finished. Expansion of Medicare in a generation, Mr. Speaker. OHIP Plus puts in place uh, free prescription medication for children across this province, children in youth, Answer. Mr. Speaker. All medications, 4,400 medications. We're expanding that to seniors, Mr. Speaker. That's a significant increase in Medicare support. Speaker, I believe that good policy should be made when a government has 15 years of rulers Ontario and not 78 days before an election. <laughs> Yesterday, Lib the Liberals' campaign promises leaves millions of Ontarians between the ages of 25 and 65 to fend for themselves with no drug coverage at all. Families will still be forced to empty their wallets to get med the medicine they need, and too many people will still cut their pills in half to make the bottle last longer. The Liberal government has had 15 years to implement a truly universal pharmacare program that covers everyone, regardless of age or income. New Democrats have a plan that will cover everyone. Why Question. don't the Liberals? Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister of Health, Long Term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. And I think certainly. Uh, uh, Member from Barry is warned. Carry on. Yes, well, thank you. Well, I would have expected uh, that uh, the third party would have uh, been so happy when they saw our OHIP Plus plan, because it sounds like we're thinking essentially along the same lines. I personally believe that our plan is a comprehensive, very broad uh, in coverage type of plan. We, of course, cover 4,400 drugs. Theirs is only 125 drugs. And we are already, of course, we on this side of the House really like to listen to people. We know that our Premier has been holding town halls. Just yesterday we were at an event and people were coming up to us to tell us what our PharmaCare uh, uh, solution has meant to them as families. That's in amazing. other words, children are able to Answer. access their drugs in a very important way. And we're now we have expanded this to seniors. We have an excellent plan and we continue to move forward. Your question, member from Durham. 
Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. For many people, infrastructure is intangible, something expensive and that can take years to build. But we know that infrastructure is more than just that. It is the water we drink, the schools our children grow up in, the hospitals where we welcome new life, and the roads that carry us home at the end of the day. And with a booming economy and growing population, now is the time to invest in infrastructure. People need and deserve that, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the minister joined the feder his federal counterpart to make an announcement that will unlock billions of dollars for priority infrastructure projects, projects in every region of the province. I know that this announcement was hugely consequential for our pro province and will shape how people live in Ontario for generations Question. to come. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he inform the House what this latest investment entails? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure. Speaker, thank you to the member for Durham. The people of Ontario are best served when all levels of government work together. Mm -hmm. yep. We have a responsibility to build the infrastructure our province needs to maintain a strong economy and a high standard of living. Speaker, our track record speaks for itself. Our own government is already making the largest infrastructure investment in Ontario's history, $190 billion over 13 years. And last week, Ontario received an $11.8 billion boost from the federal government. And Ontario was matching that with $10 billion, with over $7 billion of that amount going to our transit authorities. This joint funding will support faster commute times, cleaner air and water, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and enhance recreational facilities. These are things people need to thrive in their communities and things our province Answer. needs to maintain a booming economy and a high quality of life. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. The people of Durham know what that commitment means, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's commitment to match the federal government's investment at 33% will empower communities to build more of the infrastructure our constituents need. Last week, I was very pleased to be at the Durham Regional Headquarters to announce that the province is contributing well over $78 million in infrastructure funding to build new urban transit networks and service extensions that will transform the way Durham residents live, move, and work. This will help build and maintain fast, reliable public transit for Durham constituents, such as GO train services to Curtis and Bowmanville, which will decrease their commute time and allow them to spend more time doing the things they love doing most. Great news. But public Question. transit is only one of four priority areas receiving support through the agreement signed last week. Speaker, through you. Would the minister please share more details about the latest investment in Thank Ontario's you. infrastructure? Sir. Speaker, phase one of the federal government's infrastructure plan resulted in over 2,000 projects, with every municipality receiving formula based funding. And this new phase two promises to deliver even more for communities in every region of the province. Together, Ontario and Canada's joint investments in Ontario's infrastructure amounts to nearly $22 billion. No government in Ontario's history has invested more in infrastructure than Kathleen Wynne's. Speaker, every dollar we invest in infrastructure is at risk of being cut under a Doug Ford Conservative government. The Conservatives have totally ignored infrastructure policy, don't ask questions about it in this House, and frankly, Speaker, to quote Winston Churchill, when it comes to infrastructure Answer. and energy, the Conservatives are a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. If history Thank taught you. us anything, it is that the con New question, the member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Transportation. We have an infrastructure question. Maybe the Minister might want to get in on that. And I want to uh, congratulate the uh, Minister on her appointment. I've given her a few weeks to get acclimated to the file. But I have a question on Highway 17. The, 20, the continued twinning of Highway 17 farther into Renfrew County is a top priority for me and my constituents. We've been fighting for this for 15 years, and while we have seen some progress, clearly not enough has been made. The County of Renfrew has already done their work, the necessary work. They prepared the, the study 
and the, and, it, and the report most certainly demonstrates the need for the extension of Highway 417. Speaker, given the importance of this project to all of Eastern Ontario, can the minister assure the House that the next phase of construction will be included in this year's budget? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Uh, as he knows, our government understands the importance of expanding Highway 417 and 17 through the county of Renfrew, Renfrew for both economic growth as well as safety reasons, and we are committed to making the necessary improvements, and we are making progress, Mr. Speaker. In 2012, we finished the first phase of expansion. Phase two is also complete and open to the public on November 18, 2016. Wow. We're now able to move forward with detailed design for the next phase of the expansion of Highway 17 from Shield Drive to three kilometres west of Bruce Street in the town of Renfrew. We will continue to seek funding for construction in future budgets, and once the construction funding is confirmed, this project. Stop. There's a, a small group in here that have a W behind their name, and that the next comment is uh, naming. Just to remind you, you may finish, Minister. Wrap up, please. So once construction funding is confirmed, the project will be identified in the five-year plan portion of the Southern Highways. And in the meantime, my ministry continues regular rehabilitation Thank and you. maintenance work on the existing corridor. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you for the progress report that we already know about. We said progress has been made, but we're looking for the approval. Speaker, the minister's predecessor saw for himself the need to extend Highway 417 when he came to Renfrew County in the autumn of 2016. And while the design study has indeed been approved, local residents are calling for swift action with shovels on the, in the ground immediately. As everyone is aware, Highway 17 is a major route for commercial truck traffic, and it also connects Canadian nuclear laboratories and Garrison Petawawa to Ottawa. Additionally, this project is vital to the economic development of eastern Ontario because the roadway is part of the national east-west transportation corridor. Given how crucially important this highway is, will the minister assure this House today that the next phase of construction will be included in this year's budget? Thank you, Minister. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And uh, as I was saying, work does continue to advance on this corridor. We're committed to looking at areas for advanced construction, if and when possible, which will enable easier transitions during the future expansion. This priority continues to be a priority for myself and my ministry because of the. Uh, our government understands how vital this is. But you know, it's surprising to me, Mr. Speaker, that the Conservatives are going into this election with more radically conservative policies and Mike Harris, Tim Hudat, or Stephen Harper ever ran on. Mm. Doug Ford is promising yeah. cuts, won't admit how much, and say where they're coming from. All but two Conservative MPPs oppose Ford's leadership, some of them forcefully, Answer. and now they have to rely on Ford's billion dollars of cuts in services. The member and his party vote against the budget, each Thank one, to— Thank you. That's my job. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is, is for the Premier. The Ontario Financial Accountability Office released a report confirming that this government's cut to health care are hurting patients. The report said that even the government's future spending plans for the next three years will not be enough to ease the congestion in our emergency rooms or in hospital hallways. Mr. Speaker, will the Premier continue to stand idly by as alarm bells are ringing about the underfunding of our hospitals? Of health, long -term care. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, our Premier has been very engaged in this very file. Good. And uh, we would like to thank the Financial Accountability Office uh, for the uh, uh, good advice that uh, we always uh, receive from that office. And we certainly do recognize that a growing and aging population is contributing to the pressures faced by our health care system. And so we need to be responsive to this. We are a party that listens to families and to individuals. and we 
know that we need to put patients first, and we know that we have more to do. I think that the throne speech uh, earlier this week laid this out very clearly. Mm -hmm. Not only what we've done as a government Which through the amazing. years to continue to invest, but what we intend to do in the future, and that's why we are making a deliberate choice to run a deficit so that we can invest more mm -hmm. in health care, hospitals, home care, mental health, and long-term care and across sir. the province. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. The report from the Financial Accountability Office is not news in this House. Every day, the government hears of another patient in a washroom, in a TV room, in a hallway, in a patient lounge, or having to be in a wheelchair because there is no stretchers left for them. But nothing changes. Ontario patients deserve better. New Democrats have pledged to ensure that hospital funding will, at a minimum, keep up with inflation, population growth, and the unique needs of the population that they serve. Can the Premier make the same promise to Ontarians, or is she comfortable as her patient lie on stretcher in corridors? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I'd like to uh, set the record straight. We have a health care system that is second to none in this province. We have a health care system we can be incredibly proud of, yeah. from the health care planners to physicians to frontline nurses and all the support oh, workers. Yes, yes. And we have built a system that is doing an incredible job of taking care of the people we love. We have increased our investments in the system, and we're making significant progress. We continue to reduce wait times for surgery, increase access to <coughs> primary health care providers, and expand services for Ontarians at home and in their communities. Life expectancy is higher than the national average and one of the highest in the O. ECD. We have a system that has the best survival rates for prostate, breast, colorectal, and lung cancers in Canada. And even the Fraser Institute and, of course, the Wait Time Alliance have consistently ranked Ontario as having some of the shortest wait times in Canada. We have a world class health care system in this province. Here Thank you. Thank you. Speaker. New question, the member from Barrie. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Right. With Ontario's farmers preparing to return to the fields, there is no better time to spread awareness about how and where our local food is produced. Ontarians benefit from a strong agri-food sector, which contributes more than $37 billion to the economy, supports 800,000 jobs, and provides us all with delicious fruit, vegetables, and locally made food and beverages. This year, our government is celebrating the sixth annual Canadian Agricultural Literacy Campaign. The theme of this year's Agricultural Literacy Month is Our Food, Our Story, a message that we will help bring to classrooms across this province. Speaker, can the minister please provide further background on Agriculture Literacy Month and explain more about what our government is doing to enhance agricultural literacy and awareness in this province? Thank you. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Question. Speaker. And I want to thank the member from Barry for the question and her ongoing support for Ontario's agri-food sector. Agricultural Literacy Month is a great opportunity to teach Ontarians, especially students, about the great work being done by our farmers and provide them with the knowledge and opportunities of the agri-food sector. I'd also like to recognize the advocacy of the member from Huron, Bruce, uh, who's been very busy this, uh, in this area, too. When students understand more about the food, including where it comes from, how it's produced, and who our farmers are, this gives them the chance to think critically about the food they eat, a vital skill for our youth to develop. That's why we'll continue to partner with AgriScape, who are committed to agriculture education in Ontario, and have worked to increase food literacy and build awareness of career opportunities in the agri-food sector for 27 years. Mr. Speaker, Answer. I'm pleased to say that since 2003, our government has provided over $3 billion in funding to AgriScape to help deliver these important programs. <laughs> Supplementary. Thank you to the minister for sharing how increasing agricultural awareness improves agri-food literacy and allows us to eat healthier and, and supporting a sustainable environment and creating good jobs all across the province. Ontario students are the next generation of agri-food specialists, policymakers, farmers and consumers, and it's important that we teach them about the wide array of careers our sector has to offer. Investing in this kind of knowledge creates opportunities for our agri-food sector, whether it results in Ontarians buying local food, choosing healthier options, or choosing a career 
career in agriculture. Our agri-food sector remains one of the most diversified in the world. Speaker, could the minister share with this House what other investments we are making to increase agriculture education and support new jobs in this important industry? Yes, minister. The member for Barry for a supplementary. Of course, there's strong support uh, for agricultural literacy. Mr. Speaker, we recognize that as our economy changes, the most important driver to Ontario's competitiveness and prosperity is a highly skilled workforce. That's why our government recently announced our renewed 10-year, $713 million partnership wow, with the University of Guelph, a university that is renowned for their agricultural program, whose research and innovation remains vital to strengthen Ontario's agri-food sector. This partnership will feature greater diversity in research programming, focusing on food safety, animal welfare, and boosting Ontario's global competitiveness. Our students also benefit through the programs, like the Specialist High Skills Major, which helps to educate students on topics such as local food and farm innovation, and highlights career Answer. opportunities in the growing agri-food sector. Last year, Mr. Speaker, we saw 581 students enroll in 29 okay. agriculture and high skills programs. Thank you. New question, the member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Eleven years ago, the Liberal government promised that they would open a GO rail line from Toronto to Bolton in 2020. Now the government is saying that that won't happen until at least 2041. Oh, what? That is at a minimum 40. 20 years delay. How does the minister justify that? Thank you. Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you very much to the uh, member opposite for this very important question. Certainly, uh, Metrolinx has been doing a lot of work with the cities, with the municipalities, to ensure that we have the, the investments that help to move our people across Ontario as well as to and from work to commute. I know that there are certain municipalities that have been uh, trying to do the work that's necessary to try and get, for, get a GO station or more GO service on the area. We continue to expand GO service to many areas of uh, Toronto, or sorry, the, the, the GTHA corridor where Metrolinx uh, does their work. And that includes uh, increased GO train service on the lines that we are there, expanding bus, uh, GO bus um, transit to ensure that they can connect people with the GO trains in the uh, areas that they want, such Answer. as Cambridge and in Brantford. And we continue to work with uh, all our municipalities to try and expand GO service throughout uh, Metrolinx's planning yeah. area. The town of Caledon has done their job. They've held the land. It's you guys that are holding it up by 20 right. years. Right. This isn't the chair, please. This isn't the first time the people of Dufferin Caledon have been neglected by this government. In 2015, I asked the then Minister of Transportation to expand GO bus services to Shelburne. The response talked about high speed rail to Kitchener Waterloo. Speaker, Kitchener is almost 100 kilometres from Shelburne. That's the same high speed rail that the, Liberal promised, that the Libs promised would be ready before 2024. Based on these two examples, why should we believe any promises the Liberals are making? Right, that's right. Thank you, Speaker. And a Bolton commuter rail service feasibility study was completed in 2010, and the study examined various factors such as property requirements, environmental issues, and construction cost issues. Metrolinx is absolutely committed to go transit bus service on to Bolton while we continue to uh, build out uh, more and more expanded service through the Metrolinx planning area. But I want to go back again to the member opposite and her party that have had had many opportunities to vote in favour of budgets that contain the transit investments that this community and our province needs, and every time they have a chance to stand up in front of this in, in this legislature and vote for their investments, they vote against it each and every time. So I would encourage them to vote for our investments. Thank you. Thank you. Arriving uh, a little later on in uh, the speaker's gallery are dear friends of mine, a, a gentleman that I've known for too many years, uh, superintendent, former superintendent, now trustee, William Chop Jr. is here, Neil Chop, his brother, Aaron Chop, 
and Elliot Chop, along with their dad, 97-year-old William Chop Sr. Welcome. Mr. Chop Sr. has told me several times that he'd like to sit in the chair and do with you people. <laughs> the government house leader on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I also want to make a quick introduction. As many of you know, uh, Sinead Anderson uh, is somebody who uh, works uh, in my uh, office in the capacity as a government house leader, responsible for legislative procedure, also known as she who must be obeyed. Um, her parents are visiting uh, Queen's Park to see her in action. Please welcome Anne and Steve Anderson, mom and dad, and their, uh, her uncle Ian Anderson to Queen's Park. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Health, long term care. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I've just been informed that we're joined by David Shaw and Peter Starvopoulos. Uh, they are from the Ontario Podiatric Medical Association, and they will be at the health fair today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member from London North Centre. Thank you, Speaker. And I'm delighted to welcome a uh, constituent of mine, Deanna Rustin, who is in the uh, in the gallery today. Uh, a true uh, watcher of all of us and our work. Thank you. There being no deferred votes, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon. <laughs>